Greetings, happy warriors, and welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where, as usual, I, your rabbi, dedicate myself solemnly to revealing how the world really works and reminding you that the more that things change, the more we need to depend on those things that never change. And one of the things that never changes is the idea that it is difficult, if not impossible, to live alongside people who operate under an entirely different moral system from yours. It is very difficult to marry somebody and to maintain a marriage if the two of you have a uh, a different set of moral systems. It's difficult to have neighbors. And uh, if you are uh, a country, it is very difficult to have a peaceful border with people who have a different moral system. Israel and Gaza would be a, a very good example of this. But it is true on an individual level, just as it's true on a national level. And you only have to think about it for a moment to, to realize that this is correct. When you live with other people, whether you live with them in the same house or with a common border, there are certain things you count on. They don't even have to be explicitly mentioned. I don't believe there is any particular pact controlling the border between Canada and the United States. It's two cultures that until relatively recently have maintained uh, very close, very similar moral matrices. Right? You don't need much of a border between England and Scotland, although you have in the past. But right now, or at least up until recently, basically similar moral matrices. But uh, borders, shall we say, as in Cyprus between the Greeks and the Turks, quite a different story. Uh, borders in Ireland between Protestant Ireland and Catholic Ireland, those are issues. And so moral matrices or moral systems really do become very important indeed. Peter Singer is a moral philosopher who divides his time between the University of Melbourne in Australia and Princeton University in New Jersey in the United States. And uh, he has a number of moral pronouncements that he makes. Um, He wrote a book a few years ago called The Life You Can Save. And I've spoken about it before. In it, he says that it is immoral, it violates moral law for you to buy a third pair of pants if the two you have are perfectly serviceable. And meanwhile, that same money could help bring food or medicine to a uh, somebody in another part of the world who is short of both. Now, on that basis, said Peter Singer, uh, you basically, it is immoral for anybody to spend money on anything which is beyond your basic necessities, regardless of the fact that defining basic necessities is different for every person. But says Peter Singer, you can't uh, spend, it's not moral to spend money on anything beyond basic necessities, as long as there are people in the world who has le- who have less. And so, Uh, You can see that Peter Singer's view of morality is dependent to a great deal on uh, ideas of equality. Now, Peter Singer should actually say, according to me, according to Peter Singer's law of morality, this is the case. But the way he speaks suggests that there is a universal understanding of morality, And he, Peter Singer, is simply bringing the tablets down from the mountain for everybody to understand. But he, he, the tone of his book is that it's impossible for any reasonable person to disagree. Well, I do disagree because it's very important to note that whenever you use the word moral, 
you must define the system you are referring to. You must refer to a specific system of morality. It doesn't make sense to simply say it's immoral. It depends according to what. According to some systems of morality, things there are certain things that are moral, and according to others, the same actions are immoral. And so it's completely nonsensical for Peter Singer, or anybody else for that matter, to speak in terms of it's not moral if you do this, or this would be the moral thing to do. Says who? It depends. There's not a universal system of morality. And this is, by the way, very easy to prove by means of a thought experiment. All you got to do is uh, put a, uh, a boy and a girl on a remote, isolated desert island. This is a thought experiment. Child advocates, please note, we are not doing this. This is a thought experiment. Please note. <laughs> so... And then set up clandestine surveillance equipment and uh, watch what happens over the next few, few hundred years. And there are certain things that we can predict will happen. There are other things that uh, are extremely unlikely to happen. What do I mean? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, they are going to discover reproduction and they're going to eventually turn into a family and then a tribe. And uh, as the centuries go by, are these people likely to discover magnetism? Yeah, more than likely. I mean, there's probably magnetic stones, just, just the same as other places in the world at other times of history discovered magnetism. There's no reason why they shouldn't. Um, are they likely to discover the idea of monogamous marriage? Absolutely not. That's very unlikely. Um, because, again, you only have to carry through the thought experiment. I would say, um, if somebody came up with the idea of marriage, do you think it's more likely to be a woman or a man? Now, it's true that uh, modern-day feminists like to stress about how they don't need men. But... Um, you know, I, I remain, as so many people are, completely haunted by the pogrom that took place in Israel on October the 7th of this year, 2023. And um, uh, yes, and yes, there were, there were certainly heroic actions by women, both civilian women and women of the Israeli Defense Force. But by and large, most women recognize that in extremists, in horrible conditions of ultimate survival, most women would like to have near them a man with a weapon. Okay, that's a reality. So when women say we don't need any men, that is speaking about super luxurious, ultra civilized, very evolved society. Basically, United States. 21st century, where, yes, uh, women can dial 911 if they're threatened, and uh, women can uh, become financially self-sufficient, and women can just not have babies so they don't have that issue, and sure enough, these are the things we see happening. But when things go south, when things deteriorate, when things go very bad, yeah, women need men. So uh, on our desert island, all right, it's, if anybody were to think of marriage, it would be a woman. And she'd come along to a guy and she'd say, I've got this great idea. You know, I, I think we ought to uh, get married. Said, What's that? She says, well, it means that you forgo all other women other than me. And it means that when I have a baby, then you get to look after me you actually get to feed me because I may not be able to go out to work in the, uh, in the fields or in the fishing boat uh, when that happens. So, and meanwhile, she'll say, you know, where are you going? Why are you running? Come back. I haven't finished explaining marriage yet. And he's vanishing over the horizon. Yeah, th there's very little likelihood at all of, uh, of, of that emerging naturally. And if it did, you would find that um, in in 
both in areas of Western countries as well as other parts of the world, you'd see marriage emerging just as the, the logical, inevitable thing that people do. No, it's not logical. It's not inevitable. And they're extremely unlikely uh, to have come up with it. Um, it's just that's not how it works. One of the reasons that uh, marriage is very closely linked to religion, which is to say that in religious societies, in traditional societies, marriage is far more prevalent than elsewhere. Another thing that uh, happens is that in societies where there is a reason, there, there is a purpose in life, a purpose in life that goes beyond you know, just taking care of my next meal and getting my next little luxury and my next little toy. Um, societies that have that are societies in which uh, marriage and uh, family building tend to happen. So that's, uh, that's another reason why on our remote desert island, little growing society, we're not going to find that. Um, are they likely to discover steam power? Are they likely to discover iron? Are they likely to have a little mini industrial revolution? Quite possibly. Yeah, quite possibly they would. Um, are they likely to evolve a system of morality? I don't think so. This is one of the reasons that the system of social organization that they are likely to come up with is tribal. Because within a tribal system, you can have a basic system of morality, which is it's us against everyone outside. It's our tribe against the rest. And that pretty much will govern. You, you know, you've got to look after your own family, your own kin, your own tribe. And that'll pretty much become the system of morality. But for a society to be based not on tribalism, the only other alternative is it has to be based on a common morality. And one of the tragedies that we see happening in places like the United States of America is that uh, for the last 40 or 50 years, we've been moving away from a system of a common morality. And the result, of course, is cultural collapse. Now, before I uh, go on to explain a little bit more about the system of morality, I would ask you to please uh, make sure you are subscribed. Would you do that for me? Go ahead and subscribe to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show on whatever platform you listen to. We're available on, you know, whether it's YouTube or iTunes or Ghana or, or so many different platforms, whatever it is, they all allow you the option of subscribing to the show. And uh, I wish that you would go ahead and do that. Uh, it It's good for everybody. As far as I know, there is no downside to subscribing and only an upside, particularly for me. And uh, if you are interested in knowing more about the show, well, then for you too. Now, uh, one of the nice things about a moral system is that you don't have to be specific. And so, for instance, I spoke about uh, the border between the United States and Canada. You don't need a 3,000-page document detailing how the two nations, United States and Canada, should interact over their border. You know, there may be trade agreements and uh, border crossing agreements, but basically... Since both sides pretty much subscribe to a common system of morality, then it's kind of understood, and they don't need to detail things. Exactly the same thing happens. If a man and a woman meet and begin to talk about building a life together, ordinarily there would have to be a multi-page contract. Now, of course, many people bypass this by persuading themselves that they are unique. They're the only couple in the history of the world that love each other. Oh, we're in love. And that will solve all problems. Um, I think listeners to this show already are, are way beyond that point. And so if you're not... 
um, you know, a, uh, a person with childish views on male-female relationships, and you understand that love and romance is not all you need, regardless of what the Beatles may have sung, uh, once you know that, well, then the only alternative would appear to be a multi-page contract um, with, I mean, literally everything. Who will do what? In this partnership, you know, what is expected from each partner? And in there, there has to be, I mean, details on where they plan to live and uh, what their uh, physical intimate relationship will be like in terms of, of, shall we say, frequency of intimacy. They'll have to uh, contract to the number of children they have to agree to. Uh, they have to agree to where they live, how they live, financial arrangements, what will be saved, what won't be saved, um, what happens in the event of a breakup of the marriage, how does that get resolved. This can easily be a lawyer's dream and a human being's nightmare. I, I could easily see a marriage contract being hundreds and hundreds of pages. Well, that's not what most people do. So how do people manage to get into a marriage without that. Well, it's very simple. Two alternatives. They foolishly depend on, oh, we're in love. Uh, that's one approach. The other approach is we share a common matrix of morality. Done. Finished. Clear. I don't need anything more than that. That covers everything. And so a system of morality is going to include four main areas. And you're already familiar with the 5F program. Faith, family, finances, friendships, and fitness. And I'm going to leave faith out of it just for the moment, and that leaves the other four. And so any comprehensive moral matrix uh, will cover these four areas of life. It'll cover financial interactions. And a moral a matrix on finance will cover, oh my goodness, so many things. Um, if you are providing wheelchairs or prosthetic limbs for people who've had amputations, uh, do you have to give them away out of the goodness of your heart because those people are, uh, uh, are, are have a problem? Uh, or can you charge for them? Are you allowed to go and test drive a car from a dealer that you have absolutely no intention of buying that car? You're just doing it for fun. Um, you know, that's just two areas of so many, many, many different areas that have to be covered in terms of the morality of, of financial uh, interactions. All right, well, you know, I, I spoke about this a little bit last week. You know, what happens if... Um, something unexpected happens. As long as things are going well in a financial agreement, then uh, there's no problem. But when they're not going well, well, then people start looking for uh, whose fault is it? And people with the very best of intentions, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you, but, or, or you know, what happens if uh, uh, you buy a field and um, while plowing the field, you discover a treasure in the fields. Some ancient pirate buried a treasure there. The previous owner says, look, um, I didn't plan to sell you a treasure. I plan to sell you a field. The price was based on the idea of a field. The treasure, I never, ever sold you. And it's not a crazy position to take because uh, in many parts of the world, in the United States, I know there are places where when you buy a field, you do not automatically get the rights to minerals found in the field or oil found beneath the field. You know, those may have been sold to somebody else. So these things are not that simple. They're all part. Now, you might say, well, this is just part of a legal system. You're right, but the legal system flows from the underlying morality system because if um, there is not an underlying morality system, there is a reluctance on the part of the population to accept the laws in exactly the same way that when a big gap opens up between the morality matrix of a population and the laws under which they live, 
um, it doesn't go well. Right? When people see uh, murderers being let out of prison, murderers getting light sentences, okay, there is a moral revulsion. People start finding that there is this big gap between what they sense is morality and between what the law says, and they don't say, oh, well, that's the law. People like to know that there is coherence between the law and the underlying system of morality. And so in all of these financial areas, yes, there are laws, but the laws flow from the underlying system of morality. Think about it. One of the ways, one of the many ways in which the United States is different from most other countries is that uh, donations to charity in the United States are exempt from tax, right? So if, for instance, let us say that uh, you have $100 or 100 rupees of income and uh, the government is going to tax you at 20% and you're going to have to pay $20 of income tax, but it turns out you're going to give um, $10 away to charity. In England, what I'm about to tell you isn't true, but in the United States, the government says, oh, fine, you had $100 of income, you've given away 10, we're only going to charge you in, uh, income tax on the 90. So you'll pay 180, not to, uh, you'll pay, excuse me, you'll pay eight, uh, what did I say, 18, not 20. So uh, where does that come from? That comes from an underlying morality that was at the heart of the people who founded the United States. And so they made the law correspond to that principle of morality. Uh, and that its origin happens to be the Bible, but that's a different story. So, uh, uh, so one of the categories in which a, a moral system will have a lot to say is the financial. Another one is the family, all family interactions. Um, and, uh, and so, for instance, uh, my moral system says that uh, a man and a woman who are married to one another have to be faithful to the marriage. So um, somebody would come to me and say, but Rabbi, it's different in my marriage because my wife and I have agreed that we have an open marriage. So nobody's cheating on anybody else. We just regularly uh, have relationships with other people outside our marriage. She does and I do. And hey, we're, we're cool with that. That's all very happy. So in my mor moral system, that's not allowed because it has nothing to do with your agreement. In America's moral system, if I choose to sell my property to you, I'm allowed to do that. Now, what is more my property than my body, wouldn't you think? So what happens if I decide I want to sell my body to you, shall we say, as a slave? Turns out our revulsion at that is such that we don't allow that. You'll see that law follows morality, not the other way around. And so, as you can imagine, uh, there, there are many, many, many different aspects of morality when it comes to family, because family includes sexual relationships and it includes obligations between parents and children and between siblings and, and so on and so forth. There are just so many questions that one could come up with in under the area of family. So naturally, whenever a moral system exists, it always has a lot to say about family interactions. Uh, how about fitness? Surely a moral matrix has nothing to say about fitness. Sure it does. Fitness has everything to do with your body. How about suicide? Is that moral? Sure, in different countries, what the law is about suicide. It's obviously a moot question because you can't be prosecuted after you've taken your own life. But theoretically, at least, is there a law against suicide? Well, uh, yeah, suicide is immoral. Ah, oh, but wait a second. Canada's passed the Medical Assistance in Dying Act, which means that uh, now you can legally uh, assist somebody to take his own life. Well, in my moral system, you're not allowed to do that, regardless of even if the person asks you, even if the person signs a contract saying that's what he wants you to do. Uh, 
and so on and forth. Um, how about can I take someone else's life to defend my own? If somebody threatens my life and the only way to stop him is can I take his life? Now, if you say, well, yeah, obviously, that's only because you have been inculcated in a certain Western morality system. But it's not automatically the case. Maybe this is one of the cases where you have to be a big person and be willing to sacrifice yourself because taking life is so unthinkable that you can't possibly say that your life is worth more than anyone else's. And yes, it's unfortunate and sad that he is murdering you, but you know, that's the luck of the draw. It just happens. It's no, that doesn't give you a right to deprive him of his life. Um, how about uh, capital punishment for murder? Are we allowed to do that? How about taking the life of babies in the womb? These are all areas of morality that would come under fitness. Friendships, sure, friendships are uh, non-family, non-financial relationships. So political relationships, um, clubs, associations, gatherings, friendships, all of these all of these relationships that have no financial or family component fall under friendships, uh, including uh, military issues, if I'm a member of the military. Um, is there a moral difference between combatants and civilians? Well, one of the nice things about a, a real moral system is that it endures. What was moral a century ago is still moral today. And what was immoral 50 years ago is still immoral today. Um, that is, should be, and should be the foundation of morality and legal systems. You'll notice that in America right now, people are being penalized for things they said or did many, many, many years ago when those things were not viewed as reprehensible in any way whatsoever, let alone illegal. That would be an immoral thing to do. But it brings us back to the question of whose morality? And, and that remains a very important question. When somebody says to you, that's not moral, or that's immoral, or that is moral, uh, it would be moral if you did this, you would be right in immediately saying, well, would you mind telling me according to what system of morality, where is the book that I can go and consult to see what else is moral and what else is immoral in your system of morality? And don't let them tell you, well, everybody agrees. No, because everybody doesn't agree. There is no universal system of morality that people automatically subscribe to. Another thing about uh, morality is I've told you that it, it doesn't just emerge by itself. And that's one of, one of the things that makes it kind of difficult because uh, – if it doesn't emerge by itself, then it has to be disclosed or revealed or given. And then the question is, well, it may have been given to you, but not to me. Why should I follow it? And you've got to remember that trying to replace a system of morality with a system of law doesn't work because law is only built on morality. Um, the great British jurist John Locke um, wrote um, a multi-volume treatise on law. And the first part of it is based entirely on trying to explain how a legal system depends on an underlying moral system. So, uh, I mean, that, that is just a reality. Here's something else about a moral system, which is also not so popular, and that is it's not a la carte. You have to take the whole system or leave the whole system because all kinds of things tie into one another. For instance, I said earlier that my moral system wouldn't allow a husband and a wife to grant each other immunity from the laws of faithfulness in marriage. Okay, why would that be? Well, <laughs> because uh, in my system, the prohibition against betrayal of marriage um, is a rule of God. And it's not something that can be contradicted or, or countermanded by any people within that system. Um, so um, that, by the way, is one of the reasons 
that the uh, Ten Commandments are given on two tablets. And not only that, but that if you were to read through the five books of Moses, you'd only find about three or four or five references to the Ten Commandments. You'd find over 30 references to the two tablets. In other words, it's two-ness, it's quality of two, the duality is more important than the quality of ten. Why is that? Well, because the first tablet uh, is laws that have to do with my relationship with God. They're vertical. The second tablet contains principles five through ten, six, pardon me, six through ten, um, and those are horizontal. They're how I relate to my fellow human beings. And those two things, uh, they actually interact because it's going to turn out in many, many areas that if I do not have the divine underpinnings of the first tablet, then many of the interpersonal rules of the second tablet uh, fall away as well. So it's not, uh, none of this is simple, but um, it is important to understand. So uh, what uh, what is the moral system and where does it come from? And how I don't know how many moral systems there are in the world. Um, I think there's an Islamic-based moral system along with an Islamic-based legal system called Sharia on top of that. And I think that there's a Judeo-Christian-based Bible system of morality plus a legal system uh, in the Anglosphere based on top of that. And uh, and that's about um, that's about it. I don't know of any other systems of morality. Um, I'm not sure about China. I don't know. Uh, Africa was largely tribal, so that was how you managed without a system of morality. Um, a, much of uh, Arabia was tribal before the arrival of Islam in the sixth and uh, seventh century. So I am not aware of any uh, moral matrix that is not based on an underlying religious system. There may be, I'm just not aware of it. But what I am aware of is that secular regimes seldom endure. You know, it's the Soviet Union, you know, was about 70 years. Uh, Cuba, I don't know how much longer they'll be going. Um, Because... A secular regime means that with no religion, there probably is no moral matrix that emerged. And secular regimes try to run their societies entirely on law, entirely on legal systems, with no underpinning of a moral matrix. It does not appear to work very well at all. So now, uh, let me touch on some of the uh, questions that I looked at, hypothetical questions that I looked at in the last show, and uh, let's try and look at them in the context of a Judeo-Christian morality matrix. I spoke about the trolley problem, you might remember. You're on a railway track train, driverless train coming down, five deaf maintenance workers on the track, they're about to be killed. If you switch the lever, the train will move on to another track where it'll kill only one person. And um, um, I, I think that the whole field of utilitarian morality, which is uh, one of which Peter Singer, as I alluded to earlier, is an exponent, they would probably say, yes, you should pull the lever because that way you save four human beings and only one dies. Um, In my uh, moral matrix, you don't do that because you simply are never allowed to be the agent of the killing of another innocent person. That's different from executing a, uh, a guilty murderer. But in this case, it's not your job to, as it were, play God. Uh, is the train going to kill these five people? Sad, and there's not not a thing you can do about it. And right now, uh, there are accidents taking place in cars, and there are all kinds of horrible things. There's not a thing you can do about all those people who are being killed. Part of the dilemma and uh, challenge of being a human being. We're not gods. We're human beings. We cannot always make everything right. 
And uh, part of the progressive dream is that we can. Uh, it requires a mature outlook to recognize that life is imperfect and we have to be able to live with that. Are these five people going to be killed by the train? Yes. If you pulled the lever, would you be responsible for saving their lives? Yep. And you'd be responsible for executing that other guy on the track. Not your right to execute anybody at all, even if you think it's for a good reason. Now, if that guy was busy killing the other guys, well, then you can take his life, obviously. Shoot him without hesitation if it's the only way to save their lives. Different case, not what we're talking about. I spoke about a case where somebody uh, wanted to uh, get medicine for his wife and the evil pharmacist raised the price on the, the medicine. And uh, I asked you, is it moral for him to break into the pharmacy that night and steal the medicine for his wife? And the answer is no. It's never moral for him to do it. But he should do it anyways. And here we come to law and morality. Right? Theft isn't moral. But in this case... Go ahead, break in, steal the medicine, save your wife's life, and in the morning, turn yourself into the police and say, hey, last night I broke in and I stole a $10 bottle of medicine. The pharmacist says, well, I priced it at 1000 And a, a judge will rule on this and in all probability will say, uh, we award you damages of $10 plus the uh, costs of repairing your window and you are a horrible human being. That's you know probably what a judge would be likely to say. Um, is it moral to tell a lie in order to uh, save the lives of people who are being hunted and pursued? Uh, the answer is yes. And there are specific cases where telling a lie is the moral thing. If uh, somebody asks me um, whether... Uh, such and such an individual um, loaned me money when I was in trouble, and I know that his intention is to go and ask that person for money, I'm allowed to lie and say no. In fact, I should, because if I don't, I will be causing the, that kindness that person did me to be used against him and to penalize him. So uh, that and, and in areas of... Uh, uh, areas that have to do with husband and wife intimacy for outsiders. If outsiders ask you any questions about that area of your life, uh, you can either say none of your business or, or you can lie because that is not an area that you have to tell the truth in. So um, uh, how about um, torturing a enemy combatant in order to save the lives of uh, your people? Yeah. Absolutely. No, no question about it. Um, is there a difference between civilians and combatants? No, there isn't. None whatsoever. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, you remember I asked you how you would feel if the uh, Hamas terrorists um, did not torture and rape and do horrible, unspeakable things, um, but they executed everyone with a clean shot? wouldn't make any difference from a moral perspective. You still go in and uh, take them out. There is not a difference. And here you, you see how awkward it is. It's more than awkward. It's destructive when a uh, moral system changes with the passage of time. And one of the great things about a Judeo-Christian-based morality is hasn't changed for thousands of years, not going to change. And so uh, since it was moral to try and bring the war to an end by firebombing Tokyo and killing 100,000 civilians, yeah, that, you know, it's when your country goes to war, you're all one nation. You are part of that. And it's not as if you can designate certain gladiators to put on the uniform and go into the ring for you. You're all at war. And there's no getting away from that at all. Important thing to understand. Uh, but unfortunately, as a society develops a growing distance between its underlying morality and its legal system, 
that is a sign of impending extinction. That becomes a problem for that society, a very real problem. Um, So I think it's clear and important to understand that throughout Western civilization, the underlying system of morality is Bible-based. And upon that, Western societies then built their legal systems with a degree of variation and uh, with idiosyncratic uh, distinctions in different cultures and different nations. But by and large, that is where it's from. And so um, the, uh, the idea that life is important, that is distinctively a Bible-based idea that finds expression in the legal system of Western civilizations. In, from what I understand of Islamic culture, and I have seen this written and repeated from Islamic learned uh, sources repeatedly, is that Islam loves death the way the West loves life. Now, I can't relate to that emotionally. You know, I relate to it intellectually. I hear the words, I understand them. But I recognize it's a different culture. It's a different morality matrix. And consequently, it'll be a different legal system. And so in many countries that operate under Islam, uh, there are instances where the death penalty is meted out, often in a very harsh fashion, in a way that most Westerners simply cannot relate to. And it would be a mistake for us to say, well, that's immoral of what they're doing. No, it's, you remember what I said, you can't use the word moral or immoral without specifying the underlying moral matrix. And there are different moral matrices in the world. And you cannot judge an action taken within one under the principles of another. So that's really important that we have to understand. And if you want to understand more clearly how the morality matrix we know and the legal system built atop it emerges from the letters and verses and words of the Bible, well, then I strongly recommend you go ahead and uh, take a listen to Scrolling Through Scripture. This is an online course that we have created, uh, which I think may be, well, I don't want to, I don't want to sound uh, um, too full of myself here, but it is possibly one of the very best disclosures of how the letters and the words and the verses and the chapters of the Bible spring off the pages and become real-life guidance. It's called Scrolling Through Scripture, and uh, you will find that on the website at rabbidaniellappin.com. And I strongly recommend that you take a listen to, actually, it's more than take a listen, because you're going to listen to each lesson more than once, I guarantee it. It's called Scrolling Through Scripture. Go for it. And so um, until our next show, I wish you a week of wonderful progress with your five Fs, with your family, with your friendships, with your faith, your fitness, and your finances. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.